Good morning, everyone. Um, we are starting a little bit late today just to allow a moment to remember those who died and suffered in all wars and armed conflicts because today is Remembrance Day. Uh, this is also NAIDOC week here in Australia. And so as always, I would just like to acknowledge and to celebrate the first Australians whose traditional lands we meet. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ryan Edwards. I'm Deputy Director here at the Development Policy Centre and hosting with me, I have Arachika Okazaki. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the centre, we're a think tank focused on improving the effectiveness of Australian aid, supporting the development of Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Island region, and contributing to better development policy. Since most of our 2020 events were cancelled due to COVID, we introduced these monthly seminars as a way to keep the conversation going and more importantly to connect our region to some of the world's best researchers. And today is really no exception on that front. I'm really thrilled to have Dean y Yang or Yang, Yang, Yang you prefer, um, joining Yang. us, Yang, okay, joining us today. He's a professor in the Department of Economics and the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan in the US. And for anyone interested in migration, remittances and development, Dean doesn't need an introduction. Um, but in addition to his research, including many pioneering randomized controlled trials on migration, I do want to emphasize two other points just briefly. I'm sorry, Dean, in advance. Um, so for most academics, I think our biggest impacts that we have on the world are usually not through our research, but through our teaching and mentoring of others. Um, and one, one thing that you see is that any serious syllabus on migration and development is at least half full, not just of Dean's work, but that of his collaborators and most importantly, his empire of tremendous students. Um, yeah, and you, you go through this when you set it up and it's really quite the achievement. Um, something that's worth celebrating. I think Dean should be really proud of. Um, next, for many, many years, um, Dean has been deeply engaged with policymakers. And for the first few times I interacted with him, I was just blown away by the extent to which he's engaged with the Philippine bureaucracy. And he really does practical research, which has and continues to shape policy. And these are all things, both the policy engagement and this teacher scholar model that we take really seriously and appreciate here at the Crawford School. Anyway, enough from me. Today, Dean is going to present his new paper with Gaurav Khanna and Caroline Theoharadis, um, Abundance from Abroad, Migrant Income and Long Run Economic Development. Um, I'm particularly excited about this paper, not just because it nostalgically reminds me of my weekly trade seminars back at Dartmouth, but also because of the sheer gravity of the question that it does convincingly answer. Um, no pun intended there with gravity. <laughs> Dean's going to speak for around half an hour. Um, and since this is an economic seminar, we do welcome important or clarifying questions throughout and we'll hold a proper Q&A at the end. So you could wait till then, um, but if you raise them throughout, please do it through the Q&A Zoom function and then I'll moderate them in or unmute your microphone. So without any further ado, over to you, Dean. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Ari. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the invitation. Um, uh, I actually, uh, was last at ANU uh, giving a talk in 2016, not too long ago. If, uh, that was in person in a, the previous era that we lived. Um, but I'm very happy to be doing this virtually, uh, you know, under the, uh, the global circumstances we're living in. Um, so uh, uh, I'll uh, start sharing my slides. Um, and I believe my co-author, Gaurav, will be uh, joining us shortly. Uh, um, and I'll, of course, be, you know, as is traditional, forwarding all the tough questions uh, in his direction. Um, okay. So this is, um, this is a paper on how international income coming into a country from migrant workers who are overseas affects the long run development uh, of migrants home areas. Um, we'll be talking in particular about the Philippines, you know, we'll be looking specifically at the Philippines in this paper. Um, but I think the results are relevant uh, for many countries around the world that, uh, that have, that already have uh, large numbers of migrant workers working overseas, sending money back home. Uh, lots of policymakers around the world are interested in what kind of impacts uh, these resources have uh, on home country economic development. And many other countries, even if they don't have a lot of migrant workers right now, are thinking about this as a development strategy, you know, thinking about the desirability of sending international migrant workers away. Um, you know, policymakers around the world would like to know what kind of impacts uh, these resources have on their home, uh, on home areas and their economic development. Um, these resources uh, getting sent back to home areas, we refer to as remittances, uh, migrant remittances. And uh, here I'm just uh, sharing, uh, giving a, a broad global sense uh, over time, over the last few decades, 
of how important international migrant remittances is, remittances have been for developing countries. Um, so migrant remittances are the third largest type have you know for the last three decades or so been about, been you know in most years uh, and certainly in aggregate the second largest type of international financial flow going to developing countries. The largest um, in most years has been FDI. Uh, and recently, actually, because of the global crisis, um, remittances have actually overtaken FDI uh, as, uh, as the, as the you know, have actually become the largest type of international financial flow going to developing countries. Uh, portfolio debt and equity flows are smaller, much more volatile. Uh, and oh, this line over here is ODA, Official Development Assistance, or Foreign Aid. I think, you know, uh, it surprises a lot of people who don't study migrant remittances uh, or migration to, to realize that remittances are, uh, you know, in recent years, about three times larger uh, than official development assistance or foreign aid flows uh, going to developing countries. So this is just a huge um, uh, financial flow, a huge resource for developing countries, and it's really important to try to understand um, what its development impacts are. So that's what today's paper is about. Um, so what are we asking in this paper? Um, uh, the big question is, how does international migrant income affect long-run economic development in the home areas of migrants. Um, one thing we'll be doing very explicitly in this paper, which is pretty unusual because of the unusual data we have, is to think about home areas of migrants having global income. Uh, and by this, we simply mean uh, income from domestic sources you know, that originate within the home area or home province, as well as international income coming from migrant workers um, working overseas. Uh, this is a, um, in some ways, you know, natural to think about if you're interested, you know, if you work in taxation, uh, if you work in, uh, you know, a lot of countries tax uh, uh, their citizens' global income. Um, but it's not something that we often think about in the context of development economics um, or even, even in the context of migration studies. Um, but we can do this, you know, because we actually have access to unusual data. So we're going to be thinking about home areas in the Philippines, home provinces, provinces in the Philippines, and, uh, and how, and we're gonna be looking at impacts on global income, both domestic income in the home areas as well as uh, international migrant income. Um, so we'll be looking in particular at how a, a, a positive shock, an exogenous shock to migrant income affects the long run global income of migrant origin households uh, in the Philippines, origin provinces in the Philippines, I should say. So just to be um, explicit again about, you know, our focus on, you know, two different types of global income, we can think, you know, if we're interested in the impact of international migration and remittances on development of home countries, we can think about that in two realms. We can think about development in two realms. We can think about impacts in the domestic economy, domestic impacts, and we can think about international in impacts as well. And thinking about the international development impacts uh, is something that's distinctive about this paper. So on the domestic front, you know, this is the area where uh, the existing literature tends to focus. We think we can think about migration and remittances, um, stimulating investment in household enterprises. That can be a domestic economic impact of international migration. We can also think about firms uh, benefiting from international migration. For example, if international migrants can fund education in the home areas, we can get a better educated workforce. Might also get spillovers from migration, for example, technology adoption or facilitation of trade or FDI. Um, so th this is all well and good, and this is, you know, the, looking at impacts on the domestic economy back home is uh, one of the, you know, is, is typically the main focus of uh, studies that look at the impact of migration on development in home areas. But one thing we want to emphasize is that there are also potential gains on the international front, even if we're talking about development in home areas or provinces. And by this, we mean that home areas or provinces can start to have enhance participation and performance in the international labor market. When citizens or the people from a particular home province uh, work internationally uh, for short periods, but eventually return and also while they're away send back remittances, um, that performance in the international labor market is part of development of the home area. And this is one thing we want to emphasize in this paper. Um, so um, uh, over time, this, there can be development in this realm, in the international realm, via skill upgrading. Uh, residents of the home areas could, uh, could get more education um, move into, and move over time into skilled overseas occupations, enhancing their earning prospects in the international labor market over time. So just to be, this, we'll be looking at 
that, that development in both of these realms. You know, four particular home areas of the Philippines will be looking at domestic economic impacts in terms of production and income in the domestic economy, and we'll be looking at participation in and performance in the international labor market for people from those provinces. We'll be considering that also as development uh, of home provinces. Um, again, that's something that's uh, unique about this paper. In other words, like I said in the previous slide, we'll be looking at global income of home provinces, income from international migrant work, as well as income from domestic uh, income sources. Okay, so uh, the, a lot of the themes, I wanted to mention uh, uh, an excellent book um, that echoes some, uh, not all, but some of the themes that we'll be talking about in this paper by Jason DeParle. Uh, he's a uh, journalist uh, with the New York Times. He wrote an amazing book about Filipino international migration, basically following one Filipino family, one, one extended Filipino family over the course of three decades. DeParle met this family in the early 80s when he himself was in his 20s on a fellowship in the Philippines, a family that was living in the slum area of Manila, uh, and followed them over three decades as uh, initially one individual, the father of the family, uh, found low paid, low skilled work um, in Saudi Arabia, and then eventually funded his children and an entire uh, network of relatives and family to work overseas. And it really transformed this family's lives over the course of three decades. So some of the key themes that, that DePaul emphasizes with a lot of the granular detail you can get for this kind of study, but that are resonant with the themes that we'll be talking about here is that migrants send some financial support very widely in their social network, first of all. And then secondly, there are these uh, quite dramatic links and trajectories across generations where an initial opportunity for migration and international migrant work can have compounding magnifying effects over time. Um, in particular, in the story that DePaul is telling of this one, of this one family, um, you know, the father of the family, his initial low-skilled work in Saudi Arabia funded education for his children. And these children then later were able to migrate uh, in better, higher paid jobs over time, this, creating this really, really positive development trajectory. So you might view, you know, migration in this context, you know, in the context of this family as an intergenerational development strategy where maybe the returns from international migration were not so great for the, uh, for the initial migrant, the father, but they actually compounded over time via educational investments in the children who then migrated more overseas and in higher skilled, higher wage work in the future. Um, so that's certainly the international side uh, of things, uh, the sort of the, the international side of the ledger when we're thinking about global income. Um, of home areas. Um, DeParle happens to be pessimistic about the domestic uh, or origin area development impact. So, you know, he really emphasizes this improvement over time in international migrant opportunities and migrant income, but he isn't so optimistic about the impacts on domestic income, basically household enterprises or the domestic economy back home uh, and how it's affected by uh, international migrant work. Uh, and that's going to be an area, let me just sort of foreshadow, where our work diverges from what uh, DePaul finds. Um, we're actually going to find quite dramatic impacts on the domestic economy, positive impacts on the domestic economy as well. Um, so uh, uh, some words about international migration from the Philippines, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, so international migration is a major phenomenon in the Philippines. It affects a substantial share of the population. About one to 2% of the population um, in various census years works overseas. Um, these migrants come from about 5% of households. So about one in 20 households have a migrant at any particular point in time that you might you know, survey the population. Um, a substantially larger share of households receive remittances from overseas. So migrants uh, send remittances to quite large shares of households, uh, to quite large numbers of households. Um, and in aggregate, uh, if you add up all of the income, if you estimate all of the income of international migrant workers overseas um, and include that in the income of home areas, which is what we do in our, in our work, um, to calculate the global income uh, of home areas and, and the Philippine economy as a whole, uh, one thing we can calculate with our unusual data is that migrant income makes up 13.6% of global income in the Philippines. So it's you know, certainly not the majority, but it's, it's quite a substantial uh, fraction of, of global income that you can attribute to people uh, you know, from the Philippines. 
Um, you know, basically what we've done here again is just add, estimate all the international migrant income earned by Filipinos who are temporary over, temporarily overseas, but for the most part still eventually going to return to their home households um, because they're still being reported by people in the Philippines as members of, of their households. Uh, so about 13.6%, you know, um, this is a, a new number that didn't exist before we wrote this paper. So uh, that's one thing, first thing I wanna highlight. Um, this uh, work uh, of Filipinos overseas is largely temporary legal labor migration uh, that, people, that, that people have gotten opportunities for through licensed recruitment agencies regulated by the government, typically for short two-year contracts, um, often renewed multiple times over time. Um, but for the most part, you should be thinking about this work as temporary legal work uh, where the individuals doing this work will eventually, most, for the most part, return to the, to the Philippines. Um, Filipinos uh, for decades have gone to a very diverse set of country destinations um, driven by the Philippines' very well-developed institutions for international labor migration that date back to the 1970s. Um, in the, in the mid-1990s, which is the starting point of our study, Overseas Filipino workers, often referred to as OFWs, were located in 171 different countries. So just about everywhere on the planet, uh, you know, you could find Filipino uh, workers working on these these temporary legal labor contracts. Um, one thing that's really um, uh, striking uh, and important in 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 our study is that the origin destination patterns, the patterns of people from particular provinces in the Philippines going to particular destinations overseas. Um, are quite distinct. Home areas in the Philippines, um, you know, tend to have very specific overseas destinations where people go, and those those patterns tend to be very persistent over time. They're certainly persistent over the 20-year period of, of this paper uh, that we study in this paper, um, and that's owing to we think that that's uh, you know certainly that certainly owes to the fact that uh, this placement happens via. Um, recruitment agencies that have, you know, that work in particular areas of the Philippines and that have particular contacts overseas where they're placing workers. So those, those, um, those uh, links that facilitate placement of Filipinos at overseas jobs uh, are dependent on, these, on the specific networks of contra contracts facilitated by recruitment agencies and quite persistent over time. Um, so uh, in this work, we'll be uh, uh, analyzing a natural experiment that led to um, exogenous variation in migrant income across different home areas of the Philippines, across 82 different provinces of the Philippines. And that exogenous um, shock uh, emerged because of the international financial crisis, the, sorry, the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Um, what we'll be taking advantage of in this analysis is um, um, the fact that, first of all, different parts of the Philippines uh, had very different levels of migrant earnings per capita. So migrant international migrant income um, had a very different degree of importance in different home areas of the Philippines. Some areas had very uh, low levels of migrant income per capita. So you added up all of the international migrant income associated with different home provinces of the Philippines and divided that by the home country population. That's what I mean by migrant uh, earnings or migrant income per capita. Provinces varied quite a bit in the degree to which migrant income was important uh, relative to the home area population. Um, and that was, that's be, that was simply because, you know, there were differences in migration rates and migrant wage rates across, you know, different provinces. Um, origin provinces also varied quite substantially in their overseas destinations, which are very persistent, as I mentioned. Um, that, those are key starting points for then understanding what happened with the Asian financial crisis. So when the Asian financial crisis happened in 1997, the Philippine peso depreciated substantially, um, changed, depreciated by about 50% over the course of you know, the following several months. So this was a very dramatic exchange rate change. This led in general for migrant income all of a sudden to become much more valuable uh, when converted to Philippine pesos uh, in, in a real sense. Um, in, in its real value. Um, so it became, a, it was essentially a huge positive income shock uh, for uh, families as well as home areas that had a lot of migrants. Um, uh, an, an important aspect of the situation though is that migration destination countries also experienced large and heterogeneous exchange rate shocks. Um, uh, what this meant was that the size of the exchange rate shock you got really depended on where your migrants were going. 
Um, and different provinces actually got very different exchange rate shocks. So uh, what this led to was Philippine provinces experiencing uh, quite heterogeneous shocks to migrant income per capita. Um, I should say all of the shocks were positive, um, but, uh, but they were positive to different degrees. You know, they ranged from about, you know, a 17% um, to a uh, you know 50% improvement in exchange rates, and that gets multiplied by the baseline migrant earnings per, per capita to get you know the shock to migrant income per capita. So we look at we we this is essentially the um, uh, the natural experiment we look at to examine outcomes across 82 Philippine provinces over two decades. So our unit of analysis is going to be the province, the home area of migrants. We'll be following 82 Philippine provinces from before to after the 1997 Asian financial crisis over the course of about two decades. Um, to look at impacts on development outcomes, um, domestic income and international migrant income, making up global income of Philippine provinces. Um, so here's a sense of the exchange rate shocks we'll be looking at. So prior to the crisis, um, you know, there wasn't that much movement in, in exchange rates, but after the crisis, you know, there's quite a dramatic change and fanning out of exchange rates. So the vertical axis here is Philippine pesos per unit of foreign currency. So a, a vertical movement is a positive movement from the standpoint of um, a migrant receiving household or a mi I'm sorry, a remittance receiving household or a remittance receiving area. Um, so before, you know, basically we normalize all of these to, to one in 1996. So you can see quite dramatically the spanning out across a lot of the, the main destinations of uh, Filipino migrants. Um, it's this exchange rate variation, first of all, that we'll be taking, uh, taking advantage of as, as a, a part of the shock. And then interacting that with, uh, oh, using this variation to calculate a weighted average exchange rate shock for an area, depending on the composition of their overseas earnings. Um, and then interacting that with the, the baseline level of migrant income per capita to get the uh, R shock measure. Um, Here's just a sense of how the exchange rate shocks varied across the top 15 destinations of Filipino migrants in, um, uh, you know, in a year before the shock. This is in 1993. So Saudi Arabia is the biggest destination. Japan is second with 40, you know, about 42% and 16% of migrants. Um, and then uh, you know, other destinations are substantially smaller, but quite you know, widely uh, dispersed. Um, you can see here in this column the, you know, the, the, uh, the variation in the exchange rate shock that's driving a lot of the variation that we're looking at, you know, ranging from a high of something like 50% to actually, you know, roughly, you know, roughly no, um, you know, no change for migrants from uh, in Malaysia, for example, um, where the exchange rate depreciated by about as much as the Philippine peso. Um, okay. Um, a uh, brief word about our data. Uh, one of the distinctive things that we're doing in this paper is that we are accessing uh, a new data set that hasn't been used by researchers really before, except by, by us in one prior paper. Um, this is a data of uh, the universe of international migrant worker contracts going out from the Philippines to you know, all parts of the world, held by these two Philippine government agencies, the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration and the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration. Um, it's a quite an amazing data set, pretty unusual to be using it in, a, in an economics um, analysis, an economic analysis. Um, uh, but this really sort of is one of the distinctive features of our paper. The key thing here that we can get is migrant income. We can use this, these data to estimate migrant income emanating uh, from uh, migrant income accruing to people from particular provinces in the Philippines. And we can track it uh, for one year before the crisis and then for two years after the crisis. Basically, we'll be looking at changes from before to after the crisis in migrant income uh, before the 1997 financial crisis. Um, we also will be uh, combining these data with a more traditional survey, household survey data from the Philippines, the Family Income and Expenditure Survey, which we'll be using to calculate domestic income. So all sources of domestic income wage income, entrepreneurial income, you know, all, all types of income in, you know, from domestic sources in the Philippine provinces. We'll also be looking at some outcomes from the Philippine census of population, uh, just to get a sense of investments in education and household assets, which is a household uh, financial well-being measure. Um, okay, the, uh, um, so just to give you a sense of, you know, how this ex national experiment works. So here, are, you know, here's the Philippines divided up uh, into its 82 provinces, which are our units of analysis in this study. So again, we're looking at impacts in the home areas of migrants, uh, you know, at the province level. Um, here are two provinces that illustrate one dimension of the variation we're taking advantage of. 
So these two provinces both got, you know, a similar exchange rate shock, you know, about 37 or 38 percent, um, you know, owing to the, you know, uh, the destination weighted uh, average exchange rate shock of their uh, of their international migrant income. But they had quite different uh, levels of migrant income per capita prior to the shock. So, you know, this 37, this 37 or 38 percent exchange rate shock applied to different levels of migrant income per capita in the home area. So uh, Bulacan had, you know, substantially higher uh, migrant income per capita than Camarines Norte. So the, 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 sh the size of the shock is, is larger for Bulacan uh, because uh, the, the, the same exchange rate shock, proportional exchange rate shock applies to a larger baseline amount of international migrant income. Um, and there's also variation that we'll be exploiting in the exchange rate shock even for provinces that have the same, roughly the same level of migrant income per capita prior to the shock. So Davao del Norte and Basilan both had about 3,000 pesos um, uh, in migrant income per capita prior to the shock. Um, but they actually, because of the uh, locations of their international migrant income, they actually got very different shocks. So Basilan had a shock of about 50%, whereas Davao del Norte had a shock of about 35%. Both, you know, so both quite positive shocks. But, uh, but um, you know, larger for Basilan for, for exogenous reasons. So that illustrates the two different sources of identification we'll be taking advantage of. Variation in the exchange rate shock, holding constant migrant income per capita, and variation in migrant income per capita prior to the crisis, you know, a pre-crisis characteristic, holding constant the exchange rate shock. Um, so that, these are just examples. Here's how that variation pans out across, you know, the Philippines as a whole. Um, so this, what we're plotting here is the residual migrant income shock after partialing out all the right-hand side controls in our regression. Um, darker red um, is a, a, um, uh, our, our sort of more positive shocks. Uh, and as you can see, there's quite substantial geographic variation across all regions of the country. So every region of the country has a mixture of positive, you know, more positive and less positive shocks. One thing I should say is that, you know, don't be deceived by this legend here that has some negative numbers. All of the shocks are positive. No, you know, so uh, they're just negative here because these are residuals, uh, you know, from partialing out right-hand side controls in the regression. So we're basically, you know, looking at you know impacts deriving from variation in the positiveness of shocks uh, across areas. Um, okay, the uh, uh, here's our specific regression uh, equation. It's basically a difference in difference uh, specification. Um, where the right-hand side variable of interest is this is the shock to migrant income per capita. So basically, the exchange rate, the you know the weighted average exchange rate shock multiplied by baseline baseline migrant in income per capita, uh, interacted with a dummy for post 1997. Um, so that's what makes this a difference in difference. Uh, we're also controlling for each separate component of the shock also interacted with post. This is not where identification is coming from. The identification is coming from this term where, term where our coefficient of interest is beta, but these are important um, uh, controls for differential trends across areas. Um, uh, we're also controlling for baseline province characteristics times a linear time trend to pick up differential uh, you know, time trends across provinces that may be related with, with provinces baseline characteristics, uh, as well as province fixed effects and year fixed effects. So, and standard errors are clustered by province. So this is our regression equation. Um, I've been talking continuously for half an hour. Let me pause and uh, see if there are any questions um, that folks may have about our setup here. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, and I also just want to check to see whether my co-author Gorov is here. Um, doesn't look like he's shown up actually. Any in the Q&A, Dean. Um, but yeah. to participants, if you want to just click raise your hand, if you have anything you'd like to ask at this point, I'll be able to see that in the participant list. Okay, we've got one from Sultan Akaroi, allowed to talk. Are you there? Oh, sorry, at this point, I don't have any question. It was a mistake I raised on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. You again, no worries. Okay, all right. Well, uh, don't hesitate, you know, as, as we all know in economics, uh, it's kind of disconcerting uh, if nobody's answering, uh, asking questions, I, I think you know our norm, of course, is to always is to be interrupted every thirty seconds. So don't hesitate to do that. Um, I'll keep going. No, it's pretty clear. Uh, so far, Dean. All good. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
the uh, so here's a uh, I'm actually in the because this is supposed to be a short talk I'm actually not going to show you regression results after all even though I just showed you the regression equation uh, I'm just going to show you non parametric plots of the relationship between the residual migrant earning shock uh, on the horizontal axis you know after partialing out all the right hand side controls and the residual uh, dependent variable. So in this case, the dependent variable is global income per capita. Uh, so this is, we add up all domestic income as estimated from surveys and add up all international migrant income from a particular, pro by, earned by people from a particular provinces, a particular province and divide by province population. That's global income per capita. Okay, so it's basically income per capita, but that takes into account domestic income and international income our key dependent variable. So there's a clear positive relationship between the migrant earnings shock and global income per capita. So uh, 10 years after, uh, you know, you know the, we're basically looking for this, for this uh, figure, we're basically looking 10 years after, 10 years after the shock, global income uh, per capita is clearly positively related with the size of the you know, migrant income shock. Um, the uh, uh, and it's a large it's a large effect about a one standard deviation uh, shock leads to about a 0.22 increase in global income per capita, 0.22 standard deviation increase in global income per capita, which is about nine percent uh, of the mean. Um, the uh, uh, we can also you know as I mentioned earlier we can look at not only global income per capita but also domestic and migrant income per capita, which are the compo components of global income per capita, and both also show that positive relationship. Um, uh, both are clearly positively related. And, and you know, this, this actually was, uh, is uh, an important finding in and of itself. Uh, you know, you could imagine that there might be a, you know, if we had a shock, an initial shock to migrant in income per capita, it might raise migrant income per capita over time, uh, but not have any effect on domestic in income per capita. You know, it's an open question whether in fact there would be domestic economic effects as well. And we're clearly seeing that here. There's a, there's a positive relationship as well on uh, between the migrant earnings shock and domestic income per capita 10 years later. We can focus in on domestic income per capita uh, in, a, you know, in a bit uh, more, uh, we can focus a bit more uh, in on the dynamics of that and how that changes over time because we have more years of data for domestic income per capita. Um, so this is basically an event study where we look at, we modify the regression equation to look at effects um, in particular periods before and after the shock. Um, uh, we have a pre-period here where we, where we can look at um, uh, parallel trends. Uh, it looks like you know pretty stable. There's not much going on in the pre-period, but in the post-period, uh, well, there's nothing going on at first. Uh, over the course of you know six to twelve years, uh, we actually see a positive impact on domestic income per capita emerge over time. Uh, one of our big the big questions we're going to turn to is what explains that. Um, and I'll forecast right now that uh, key explanations are going to be investment in education and uh, investment in domestic enterprises. Um, and given that those are the mechanisms that we can identify, it makes sense actually that the, that the effect actually only appears after some time, only in sort of like roughly six to 12 years after the shock, because the investments in, in enterprises and in particular education need some time to bear fruit. Um, so it's sensible that the effects are, you know, showing up with a little bit of a lag after the initial shock. Um, okay, so um, another thing that we show, which, you know, is pretty important to highlight is that not only are we seeing in income going up, but we're also seeing me other measures of financial well-being going up. Consumption per capita goes up in response to the shock, as well as household assets, you know, the average of household assets that we can observe in the province. Um, those also go up, you know, uh, quite dramatically over time. So, you know, not just income is going up, but also me other measures of financial well-being like consumption and assets. Um, the, uh, so, so these are the top line, you know, findings, positive impacts of the shock on um, global income, as well as each component, domestic income and migrant income. We want to delve deeper now and ask what the mechanisms are be behind these long run effects. Um, uh, so what we do is we write down a structural model uh, of migration. We adapt a Neaton and Corbin model for migration along the lines of what Shea et al. 2019 and Brian and Morton 2019 have done. Basically, this is a model of comparative advantage in migration um, that, uh, that takes into account that origin areas may have a com comparative advantage in terms of their productivity in different destinations. Um, and uh, people take that into account when deciding where to migrate, but they also are limited by the cost of migration 
um, uh, two particular places. And this makes it very analogous to sort of models of trade, comparative advantage in trade, which is what uh, Eden and Cortum, Cortum um, uh, represent. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, we augment uh, this basic framework to allow education and enterprise investments, um, you know, incorporate that into the, you know, the resulting gravity model. Um, and, you know, uh, in this context, we're, imag we're thinking of migrant income helping alleviate liquidity constraints on these investments. Um, okay, I see, uh, I see some chats here. Um, okay, I'm just going to let some chat accumulate. Um, okay, so the, um, uh, and what we'll be using the model to do is to quantify the educational and enterprise investment pathways or mechanisms through which the effects operate. Um, okay, the, um, uh, just to give you, I, we're not given the limited time that we have, I'll just give you a, I'll show you a diagram that illustrates what the model does. I'm not going to show you any, any equations. Feel free to have a look at the paper, of course. Uh, so what the model does is it tries to link, uh, what it does is it links an initial migrant income shock with future migrant income and domestic income, which then lead to global income. So migrant income and domestic income make up global income. What, how does the migrant income shock eventually lead to changes in migrant income and global income? Well, first of all, simply the change in exchange rates uh, leads to higher wages per migrant, which then leads to higher migrant income. Um, I see my co-author Gaurav is here. Welcome, Gaurav. Um, uh, uh, in addition, uh, these higher wages per migrant then attract more migration. So you can get more migration, which then leads to more migrant income as well. Um, the migrant income shock can also lead to some uh, additional educational investments. And the educational investments themselves uh, can lead to more migration if more skilled individuals migrate. Um, and, um, and then uh, uh, higher skilled migrants also can earn higher income, um, you know, just high, because higher skilled migration involves higher wages or you know, higher, higher skilled uh, jobs have higher wages. Educational investments also uh, promote domestic income because higher, more, more educated workers are more productive even in domestic um, um, income earning activities. And then finally, the inc migrant income shock can also um, uh, fund enterprise investments. You know, they can loosen liquidity constraints on investments in, in household enterprises, which then lead to higher domestic income. So this is the, you know, this is broadly the schematic of the model. Uh, you know, these are the different, you know, components of it. And what we'll be doing is we'll estimate the share of long run impacts on global income as well as on migrant income and domestic income separately that come through these different channels. Um, so ass assuming we, you know, assuming the, 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 assuming that this is the right, uh, this is the way the world works, we'll be able to apportion the um, uh, contributions of uh, educational investments in particular and enterprise investments. Um, so uh, in terms of decomposition, the first big decomposition is not really model derived, it's simply derived from our initial, from our reduced form regression estimates. Uh, the first big finding is that three quarters of the gains in global income actually are due to gains in domestic income. Um, we think that's pretty striking. Uh, so you get an initial shock that is purely in the realm of migrant income. And over the course of a decade, there are gains in both migrant income and domestic income. Um, but three quarters of the gains are actually in the domestic economy, are actually in income earning up, in, income, um, uh, income that accrues in the domestic economy. Uh, and we show in other analyses within the paper that this is mostly due to entrepreneurial uh, income. It's not being driven by wage income, it's really being driven by entrepreneurial income, so household entrepreneurship. Um, so that's just prima facie evidence that, that there's a greater investment in household um, uh, enterprises. Um, uh, we are, you know, so now turning to education, um, before I show you the quantification of how much education uh, matters in the, in the model, uh, let me just you know, show, first of all, that uh, years of education do go up as well. And that's one of the other key results uh, in the paper, the migrant earning shock leads to a substantial increase in education. Uh, it's quite large in magnitude. Um, this improvement in education uh, appears to lead to more international migration as more, you know, because more skilled uh, populations are better able to secure jobs overseas. So there's uh, an increase in migrant contracts per capita. Um, and this migration is in higher skilled jobs. Um, or th this migration takes place 
uh, among more skilled individuals. So a higher share of migrants are skilled and uh, they work in higher skilled jobs. Uh, so this is the share of migrants in professional jobs. You can slice this in different ways, but basically it's clear from the occupational data that migrants uh, are increasingly uh, in working in higher skilled jobs when their home areas get uh, these positive migrant earning shocks. You can even see this in the aggregate data. Now this is not you know, making a causal statement, but it's you know, quite consistent with the aggregate shift that we're seeing in the economy over the you know, two decade period. Um, this is basically a probability density function of the skill levels uh, of migrants who are going overseas. And in the Philippines as a whole, there's quite a dramatic shift from the red density to the blue density, basically representing higher skill levels uh, of migrants. Uh, so in the economy, we think you know, this is the certainly helping explain the, you know, the aggregate uh, improvement in skill levels among migrants coming from the Philippines over this 20 year period. Um, that results overall in the end in higher earnings per migrant, higher income per migrant. So if we just look at annual income per migrant from particular provinces, that's clearly going up as well. Um, so putting all of this together, uh, um, the model, uh, our, our estimate through the model is that 24% of the total increase in global income is, uh, is attributable to the fact that people are getting more educated in home provinces. Um, uh, but we can also look at how this breaks out if we, the role of education, if we look at migrant income specifically or domestic income specifically. So if you look at just the role of education in contributing to higher migrant income, uh, education has a larger role. So about 42% of the increase in migrant income were attributing to the interim increase in educational investments. Uh, the remainder 66% comes from uh, simply the fact that you got this you know, initial migrant income shock that, that changed uh, exchange rates. Um, uh, so the um, uh, educational, educational investments play a large role in explaining the migrant income gains. When it comes to domestic income, uh, the picture looks a little bit different. Educational investments are still important. They, they, they explain about 18% of the increase in domestic income, um, but uh, uh, a bigger role, 56% is attributable to enterprise investments. Um, so that's, uh, that's how the decomposition breaks down. Um, uh, for uh, domestic income. Here, there's a table in the paper that summarizes all the different decompositions um, that I just went through. So uh, let me summarize so that we can uh, turn to questions. Um, so broadly here, we're studying how improvements in income from international labor migration affect orange and provinces in the Philippines. Um, we're using novel administrative data combined with a large scale natural experiment. And we interpret the results in the context of a structural migration model. Uh, you know, we, we uh, are able to have uh, unusual insight into the global income of home areas, uh, income from both domestic and international migrant sources. Um, and we show that an initial positive shock to migrant income um, initiates what we, what we think of as a virtuous circle, a virtuous cycle that magnifies gains in the long run. So migration rates rise uh, and they rise in higher skilled, high, they increasingly move into higher skilled and higher wage jobs. So purely if we're just thinking about the international side of the ledger, migrant income, uh, you know, uh, actually sort of uh, magnifies and really uh, um, uh, becomes a much more prominent thing uh, in home provinces. But at the same time, domestic incomes rise as well, uh, mainly from household enterprises, uh, and actually account for the vast majority, 70, 75% of all the gains if you look over a decade period. Finally, we can use the model to, uh, uh, to show that educational investments underlie an important share of these long run gains. So the interim investments in education um, uh, are, are an important mechanism through which these, you know, we get these long run gains. Um, so let me stop there. Uh, I've gone a little bit over time, but uh, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity and I'm happy, we're happy to take questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dean. So yeah, this, I, I learned a lot and I'm really glad that you took the time to share it with us. Um, I just wanted to also mention for our students who joined us as well in this seminar, um, I know the authors are definitely not on the job market this season, um, but I, it did strike me when reading this paper that it really is a great example of what, at least from my perspective, the very best job market papers of the last few years have, have been like. They basically have an, a real good level of technical detail, but they're distilled in such a way that it's just a joy to read that you're not stuck on stuff on that stuff while you're going through it. I thought you guys did a really fabulous job of that. So anyway, I, I urge you guys to study it closely. Um,
<laughs> it's, a, it's a great example of a paper in that regard. Um, so onto a few questions. Please do use the raise hand button in the participant list so I can come to you. It looks like Gaurav has been very busy in the Q&A dealing with all the ones that did pop up. Hopefully everyone can see those answers. Uh, so well, welcome Gaurav first. Um, but yes, I have a few questions of my own, which I'll leave in, but I would prefer to go to participants first. So yes, please do use the raise hand button or if you want, again, just post it into Q&A, then I'll know you're there and I can come to you in a different way. Uh, and please do also just briefly introduce yourself first. Um, so Dean and I know who you are. Woody, uh, uh, did you? Yeah. Hi, Buddy. I'm going to allow you to talk. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean, for the, uh, your presentation. Uh, my, na um, my name is Buddy. I'm a faculty member in Crawford. Uh, so during the financial crisis, um, the, the, uh, the exchange rate change also created, particularly looking at the experience in Indonesia, is uh, increase in commodity prices. So uh, the impact of crisis within urban and rural area has been very different. Uh, in urban area, it was a shock, industry was uh, collapsed. And so I mean, imagine that income from outside, like what you simulate is matter, but in the rural area where commodity boom is happening, uh, what I observe in Indonesia, people are buying motorcycle and so on. So there is this uh, aspect of rural, urban, and sectoral uh, situation that I'm not sure it is. It has been, um, although I understand that you use a, a, a fixed effect, but I don't. I just wonder that that could actually. Uh, influence has some correlation mm -hmm. as well with what you mm -hmm. are experimenting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, Woody, this is a thank you uh, for the question. Um, one thing that is uh, important about the this national experiment is that it is happening in the context of a major economic crisis, at least or at least initially. Uh, obviously, we're we're certainly we're we're taking a long term view. We're looking, you know, uh, up to twelve years after the shock. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of those effects would dissipate over time and we, you know, you might know we're no longer going to be analyzing a crisis situation, but you are bringing up a valid point. And I think it's a, it's a type of omitted variable concern that home areas in the Philippines, uh, different home areas might be, different provinces might be affected differently by the international, uh, by the Asian financial crisis, um, you know, via their, you know, potentially different levels of connection to the international economy different uh, industrial or trade composition. Um, uh, we think that's important to worry about. We do worry about that. And you know, I think the, the evidence in the paper suggests that omitted variables of this sort are probably not uh, particularly important, basically because if we uh, exclude or include um, a set of controls for baseline province characteristics that, that, that we think should predict um, trends over time, including how affected they were by the Asian financial crisis via other channels, it doesn't change the estimates very much. And if anything, most of the estimates actually go uh, become more uh, become larger in magnitude uh, when we include, you know, quite a quite extensive set of base controls for baseline characteristics interacted with time trends to, to capture any time trends that may be different across, across provinces with different province characteristics. Happy to talk about this in more detail, but but I think um, those types of concerns are important to, to to think about, and I think you know I, I think we've I hope we've done a sufficient job uh, addressing those types of concerns in the paper. Great, thanks, um, Martin. Hi, there? Martin. Hi, Dean. Um, we met the last time we yes. were here ages ago. I've got just mo more of a comment um, than a question. Uh, I, I know you're familiar with my and Taryn's second paper, the one on structural change in Malawi from migration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I, I'm very excited about your results and you can do things with your data that we can't do. But the thing that excites me the most is the very similar findings in completely different geographic settings and mm -hmm. completely different economic environments. Mm 
yeah. that we're both finding this uh, boost to the local environment following migration. This is, I think this mm -hmm. is really important from a migration policy perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's just I point. completely agree. Yeah. No, I, your your paper, you know, and we you know, we we cite your work for sure in the in our paper. Likewise. Uh, it's like a nice uh, yeah, I mean it, it's just a uh, there's there aren't many studies uh, like ours, uh, like yours and, and ours, um, that can look at um, how uh, an exogenous shock to migration opportunities um, you know, affects places in the long run. Um, yeah, so no, your, your, your paper you know, clearly is an important precursor for ours. Uh, and I think it is, I agree, it's very striking that, that we find very similar uh, impacts on education and other outcomes. Yeah, so good luck with the paper. Thanks. So if my memory serves me correctly, I think we have a question. I'm, I'm going to jump into the Q&A and go to one from Rick, Ricker. If you wanted to raise your hand and ask it um, verbally, that's fine, but I can also read it. I believe she's one of our colleagues from De La Salle University in Manila, if my memory serves me correctly. So she's asking, in your findings, when educational investments increase, and this leads to more skilled migration, wondering if the data reflect if this includes secondary and more years, or if it's more focused on tech and bucket and tertiary. Ah uh, yes, um, we uh, we have done uh, detailed analyses of that sort, and we can we can certainly do more. Um, the uh, those detailed analyses are mostly not in the paper, but one thing that we do show that's in the paper in the appendix is that um, the effects are particularly pronounced at the at the uh, among nineteen to twenty four year olds. So if you look at the years of education of 19 to 24 year olds, which are basically going to be tertiary level individuals, that's where a lot of the effects are concentrated. The effects are particularly large you know, at, that, at that level. It's not affecting the education levels of like younger uh, individuals as much. Um, so that's one indication that there's a lot going on at the, at the tertiary level. And that's, you know, that's consistent with, um, uh, with increases in skill, uh, skilled jobs that migrants are, get because, you know, are getting, because you know, moving from you know, sort of four to six years of education is not going to have much impact on your ability to get international, uh, you know, contract work uh, compared to being able to get more years of tertiary education. So that is that is uh, that is what we're finding. We can probably do more to you know, to look um, in more detail, perhaps with other data sets, at particular educational qualifications that people are getting, um, but we haven't done that yet. But certainly, you know. Uh, our co-author Caroline has certainly done a, you know, a great deal of looking at specific, um, you know, high skill jobs like nursing uh, in the Philippines and how those have changed over time quite dramatically. Next up, Larry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, interesting, re really interesting presentation. So um, if I understand correctly, so this paper look at the, the, the impact of a one-time income shock on the long run uh, economic develop, development. I noticed that in the re regression equation, there is a, a term called trend, which I think is to include the variables which affects the long run trend in the baseline. Uh, if, um, if I'm correct, then I'm interested in how you deal with this uh, uh, trend term, because my worry is that um, in a decade long period, there should be many, many, many changes are happening domestically and also internationally in the baseline, even without income shock. So can you explain a little, uh, a little bit more how you deal with this uh, trend term? Yeah, um, I'm happy to uh, talk about that in more detail. Um, let me uh, um, go back to that slide. I'll just go back to the uh, regression equation. Where is that? Here it is. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, the, you're talking about this term over here. Um, uh, so this this trend this term over here. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, is the uh, is basically the term that picks up uh, linear. Uh, a linear time trend inter interacted with baseline province characteristics, and that's intended to pick up 
any um, heterogeneity in long run time trends that are related with province's initial characteristics. So rural, urban, uh, you know, rural share of population, uh, education levels, um, you know, uh, wealth measured by an asset index, et cetera. Um, so that's what that term is in there for. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it is intended to, to, you know, it's, it's not the most flexible trend uh, uh, control that you might imagine. You might imagine including a quadratic or, you know, higher order terms in, in time. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you um, are getting at. Um, if, you know, feel free to, to, um, to elaborate if you'd like. Larry, about what you're thinking about. Yeah, can I, uh, can I just ask um, a follow-up question? So yeah. if, uh, if this 80 province in Philippines have different uh, trade relationship with, with uh, our other countries around the world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if, the, you know, if this external environment changes around the world, they may have different impacts on this uh, our, uh, economic development in this different uh, province, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I think the I think um, I think you're right to bring that up. I think uh, um, a previous question, uh, you know, I think the first question was was I think I would view that as you know similar to the first question on, on omitted variables. Um, uh, you know, basically the 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 concern is that the shock to market income per capita that we're focusing on here may be correlated with with other shocks to provinces like via trade or FDI. Um, uh, whether due to the Asian financial crisis or not. So it could be, you know, it could be because of the Asian financial, some other impact of the Asian financial crisis or some other, some other, you know, thing that's driving changes over time entirely, something not related to the Asian financial crisis. So I think, you know, the best we can do is, is uh, you know, uh, frankly, to just include, to look at the, how robust the results are to including or excluding this, this, um, this trend term, this, you know, this basically, this term here picks up is our, you know, is what we can do to pick up um, baseline, prop, you know, uh, differences over time in, in, in trends that are, you know, due, that are related to provinces baseline characteristics. Uh, and like I said earlier, uh, our coefficient beta is very, is quite, you know, quite stable uh, to exclusion or inclusion of, of this term. Um, I might, you, we're almost at time. Um, so I might just use my privilege as chair to ask the, a last question. Yeah, um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. <laughs> so one sense that I got from a lot of the stuff in the paper was that you're kind of picking up the sort of organic responses that individuals and communities were having to the shock and to the incentives offered to them from migration. Um, um, I'm, how, do, how do we think about this in relation to, so, and part of the gains that were getting ratcheted in was the ability to participate more in the international labor market. Mm -hmm. so what, what was the Philippines government doing over this space? So I'm curious because a lot of the countries that we think about migration in, the governments and aid agencies are super active in trying to micromanage and steer migration into certain sectors over certain durations and things like that. Um, are your results sort of overcoming and do we think of that as just a just background noise that's going on in here or were they quite busy in steering this and in particular do you think they helped or hindered these gains that you that you see um and if not what would you have suggested see. in terms of that policy well no that's really interesting i don't know that the philippine government was aware that this was happening i mean I, you know uh um the i think this is new uh, to everyone. On the one hand, I think I think it was widely appreciated that the Asian financial crisis, while generally a negative shock for the Philippine economy, did have a positive angle via you know increasing the real uh, value of international migrant income, uh, and it's you know uh, and increasing you know the ability to to, to remit to the Philippines. Um, you know, the value of remittances uh, or of remittable resources going to the Philippines. Uh, so I think that's widely recognized, but I think these dip, these local economic impacts in home provinces has not been widely recognized. And I also think, you know, more to your point, this upgrading over time of the skill levels and wage levels of migrants in places that got them more positive income shocks, I think that also was not uh, uh, 
that, that to my knowledge that hasn't uh, been recognized. So that's you know that's why we're very excited about you know getting this paper you know more out there and and getting people to know about this paper. Um, so I don't you know. Uh, and so because of that, I don't think there was anything that the government uh, it did intentionally to magnify or build on these effects. Um, but of course, you know, you could imagine that there, there could be things you could do uh, to magnify these effects by a policy. So if you knew that a particular area was getting an increase in migrant income, um, you know, either because of an exchange rate shock or because there had been a you know, an induced increase in out migration, you could try to, you know, enhance some of these effects by facilitating educational investments, um, maybe by, uh, you know, facilitating training for jobs in, you know, higher skilled, you know, higher skilled jobs um, in the international economy, in the international labor market, you know, there's a number of things you might imagine doing in terms of both educational investments and say, uh, job placement in higher skilled work uh, to, uh, to magnify these effects. One thing that's quite popular in the Pacific at the moment is the idea of trying to increase recruitment intensity in the more rural areas that have missed out on migration opportunities so far. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I got, yeah, so I get the sense here that, that this already hasn't been recognized. And so maybe that might be the next step from the Philippine government in response to your findings or something. Um, yeah, no, that, that was... That was, my, that was my only, only, only main thought. I thought it was a really ex wonderfully executed paper. Thank so you. I, I might wrap, wrap up then. Um, so yeah, a huge thank you to Dean for joining us and thank you to everyone else on the line. Um, this is a really good way for us to almost end the year. Um, I also just wanted to mention that these events and just about everything that you see us doing here on labor mobility and development in the Pacific is part of the Australian government's Pacific research program. And we are grateful that they support us in creating some of these spaces. Um, and I just wanted to flag that our final seminar for the year will be my colleagues, Stephen Howes and Richard Curtin. And they're gonna present on their work on the governance of the seasonal worker program in Australia and sending countries and potential um, reforms in that, in that space. Um, so I really hope that everyone can join us for that too. Thank you again for joining. Please take care of yourselves. Um, and thank you. Thank you to Dean, please join me in thanking him. Um, and yeah, be in touch. Thank you.